Well, hello, church. We left off last time with the promise that there would be a lot of deconstruction, but it would lead us to a happy, secure place, solidly placed upon the one true foundation of the lordship and deity of Jesus. On the way, we're going to have to discard a lot of false idols, and it's a painful process. I will not pretend otherwise. In fact, if you do it right, life is a series of picking up and discarding ideas and idols. The trick is to get the mix right of what you pick up and keep and what you discard along the way. And let me also remind you of this and give you some peace early on in this discussion. Getting it right is not what saves you. Jesus is who saves you. Not your perfection. Not your precision in doctrine and in practice or your understanding. It is Jesus, and it is not Jesus' hand. It is Jesus who saves us. That said, getting the mix right makes life a lot more joyful. So let's get started by telling a very personal story, and today is going to be very personal. When I was a boy, I was a member of one of those many churches we talked about last week who believed that they were the one true church that all others were in error. While if pressed and said, you guys believe you're the only ones going to heaven, inside we said yes, but outside we would say things like, well, that's not for us to judge. But we did. We did. We didn't mean to be hypocrites about it. It was a matter of our faith that we had found the way, the only way. We had our own strange catechism, Although we would have hated anybody who used the word catechism or creed. But it was things, you know, can a person do this? No. Can a person do that? No. We had it, we had it nailed. We even had, a, you know, why do the Baptists use instruments? They don't believe the Bible. Why do the Catholics have a Pope? They don't believe the Bible. See, the Bible was the reason we knew all the answers and the others didn't. Because we read it and they didn't. That's what we were told. We took it seriously and they didn't. And yet, even in that heavily guarded bubble that continued when I left home at 16 to go to one of our our faith's approved institutions of higher learning, I began to question. I began to see cracks in the bubble. I found out that people who didn't believe what I'd been told to believe loved God just as much, or to be honest, more than I did. Some of these people wore shorts and went swimming at the beach. Now, I had always been told we were opposed to mixed bathing. I found out that meant swimming with boys and girls, which is not nearly as interesting as what I thought mixed bathing was, but we were still dead opposed. Some of them danced. Some of them had records. Kids, those were flat oil-based products that you could spend and get music out of. Some of them had records with hymns that had instrumental backing. Some of them thought the Baptist might have a chance of making it to heaven. And all these weird ideas were very shocking to me. And the people who had them were still in my religious tribe. But I couldn't help but wonder, are they really? In fact, our preacher had said on many occasions that if God came back while we were all sitting there worshiping, that not all of us who thought we were going to heaven would rise. Which is terrifying. But I believed it. I've been told all my life, that people who didn't believe what we believed loved God less. But I was seeing that that wasn't true. I'd been told that the Bible was simple to understand, written to simple people so that anyone who was honest and approached it honestly would come to exactly the same conclusions to which my tribe had come. But here's the thing. None of us had done that. All of us had come to our conclusions because people in our tribe had told us their conclusions. And we believed them because they were authoritative in the way they spoke and because the community enforced conformity. We had a priesthood. We had creed. We had catechism. We were a denomination, although we would have denied all of that furiously with anger, righteous anger. (coughs) Yeah, the creeds were unwritten. They were even unspoken. 
but they were known and enforced. And by the way, the church from which I came was not alone. This story can be said by people from many different Protestant denominations. You know the story. For many of you who found our safe harbor, it's your story. <coughs> How pervasive is this? Well, several years ago, I was with a church leadership who was struggling with a really difficult biblical question. This is a question which has divided scholars for hundreds and hundreds of years and still does today. And yet, in the room, I knew the person who just was, was, was about to say what I'm going to quote had never read a theological tome in their life. They had read devotional books, mainly written by people from their religious group. And they looked at me and smiled and said, I don't understand what all the fuss is. Quote, God wouldn't give us a scripture that wasn't easy to understand. And I went silent, because what do you say? And growing up, I had doubts but I refused to entertain them out of fear. God would read my thoughts and realize I wasn't faithful and therefore not save me. And yet Peter would have disagreed with this individual. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he says some of the things Paul wrote are really difficult to understand. Wait a minute. Doesn't that make you wonder how easy the Bible is to understand or how hard it might be? Peter had walked with Christ. Peter knew Paul. I didn't walk with Christ. I didn't know Paul. Peter had done both. And Paul said, and Peter said, he writes stuff that's really, it's difficult. If Peter can say that, why can't we? Well, spoiler alert, you can, but I didn't know that yet. At gatherings of our church leaders, I saw leaders get angry with each other, shouting at times, waving Bibles in the air, thumping them hard against their hands. I've actually never seen anybody thump it on a, on a pulpit, but on hands, I've seen it. Each of them declaring that they were the ones who read their Bible honestly and believed it, quote, as it was written without human interpretation. Another spoiler alert. You can't do anything without human interpretation. Period. A few years ago, the internet was in an uproar over whether a dress was yellow or blue. That is a fact. We interpret everything. And you cannot get that out of the way. You were designed for it. But moving on, I wasn't allowed to go to youth rallies because even those hosted by people from my tribe, the speaker might be somebody that my father disapproved of or the song leader might lead some songs that were not approved by the larger group. Or it could be that the haircuts that were there would not be acceptable. Yes, this was back in the 60s and 70s. Hair was a dividing church issue. They were afraid that if I went to these places, I might enjoy things and therefore get my mind poisoned to the one true faith. For my part, I knew we were the one true church. I knew that all the others had the Bible wrong. And even many of those that had the same name on the outside that we had on our building, I knew they weren't really faithful because that's what I'd been told. And I accepted the conclusions I was handled. And the community enforced it. But then, I would read about Mother Teresa, for one example among many. And her love for God demonstrated by her caring for the poorest of the poor, and I could see we weren't doing that. Our energies were all designed to get people into our church buildings and into our faith. Even enforcing church building rules. Building them and then enforcing the rules of what could happen inside our church buildings. We even went so far as to when we gave food out, stamp our name of our church and the address and a phone number on the cans of food given to the poor. So that would be evangelism. To think of Mother Teresa spending an eternity in hell because she was in the wrong religion did give me pause in quiet moments that I tried to avoid because I didn't want to upset God by thinking that way. I think the only thing that caused me to be able to shove that away was my already scientific mind told me, facts don't care about your feelings. This feels wrong, but the facts are the facts and you guys are the true church. 
By the way, that would be a double-edged sword that would come back to cut me more often than I can count. I mentioned I left home at 16. I knew the Bible forward and backwards. I really did. We had been shown Hebrew flashcards and Bible flashcards since I was, since, well, since I can remember. We knew our stuff. We had memorized almost little books like Ready Answers to Religious Errors that named the churches around us and then how to answer them and just, you know, knock them down with scripture. We had the Haley's Bible Handbook and we had De Hoff's and we had all this other. And although we needed no other book than the Bible, we always had those two. And we learned how to use the Bible in bits and pieces to prove what we already believed was true. But the thing was, I wasn't prepared for life outside the bubble. I wasn't emotionally grown up enough. I wasn't ready for this. What hurt and helped me all at the same time, however, was that I've always been a person who loved being alone and quiet. And the, God did not give me an awful lot of gifts, but he gave me the ability to read and remember what I read and a mind that will not let it go until I've found the source. As my wife has said more than once, if I see a thread, someone's losing a sweater. I want to know where this comes from. And I want to know the legitimacy of the argument the whole way. I plan to do a series eventually on Monday mornings in little sound bites on how we got our Bibles, which is a fascinating story. So I'll set aside that subject for now. I'll just share some things I noticed that gave me a lot of trouble. I was always told that the Bible was the express word of God that he dictated to humans as if to a secretary to write down exactly his words and that they were perfect and the Bible exactly were the words of God. At least the original manuscripts were. It didn't dawn on me till much later that that was by itself a statement of faith with zero evidence or substance, because to this day, we do not have any original book of the Bible. None. We have copies of copies of copies. Do I still believe that those copies are legitimate and accurate enough for us? Yes, I do. But to state that they were pristinely given by God and then preserved perfectly, we know that's not anything we can prove. Now, for some of you, that's not a problem. You're able to just say, well, I believe it. Fine. And I, I somewhat envy you having that ability. But for most of us, when we run into the real world with Scripture and things begin to chafe and crack, it's not acceptable just to say, I believe it. Or even worse, when we actually read the Bible. I mentioned last week, I tried to do these things without being a jerk, but sometimes just doing them makes you a jerk. And I can remember being in one room with 20 some leaders of this big church. And they, they really, were, they would just wanted to call me in there and just nail me with questions. And I, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. And so I was having a good time doing it. But they kept insisting, you know, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And I said, you really hallow the Bible as the inerrant word of God. And they're going, yes, yes, of course. Only, only a heathen would not. And I said, and you're leading this church. And they said, yes, yes. And I said, all right, who here can give me the Ten Commandments in order? And not one could. I said, how about the Beatitudes? In order. Jesus' first sermon, first words out of his mouth. They all around them could get them, but it took a committee. And I'm going, you are defending a book you don't know. You're claiming it's the inerrant word of God and you've not read it. In fact, if you read it, You'll hear stories. You'll hear uh, you know, of Balaam and you'll be able to see the evangelist and their stories. But have you read the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles? I say book because they really are one book. We call them two because they were so long they were put on separate scrolls. But they're one book. In the book of Kings, David is an awful father. He's a murderer who committed treason, wife stealing, and more. He, he was just abysmal to his wife, Michael. 
He was a man that you and I would not sit down for a cup of coffee with unless there were bars between us. In the book of Chronicles, he's perfect. None of that stuff. In the book of Kings, the transition of power after the death of David is racked with war, civil wars, rapes in public, and all the other tragedies. In the book of Chronicles, peaceful. Second Chronicles and 1 Samuel even disagree with 2 Samuel about who killed Goliath. Yeah, one says David. The other says Elhanan. Have you read the book? In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, God is so angry with Israel that he purposefully, intentionally tempts David to take a, sen- a census which is sinful and will bring horrific consequences upon the nation. God tempts David. If you read Second, First Chronicles, I'm sorry, chapter 21, verse 1, it's Satan who does that. I could go on for more than a hundred examples easily. But let's just move to the New Testament. I love the Gospels. The Gospels are where I live. And yet, John puts the Lord's Supper on a different night than the other three. The other three Gospels, by the way, have it on Passover. John has it earlier. Speaking of that supper, some Gospels have Jesus sharing the bread and then the wine. But Luke has wine, bread, and wine. In our church, it was so regimented. That if anybody had passed the juice first, people wouldn't take it. I'd seen it happen. Where somebody prayed the wrong prayer and prayed for the juice first. And then they started taking, and, and the other guys wouldn't take the tray. No, 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 we can't do that. We had, and oh, I apologize, we're supposed to start with the bread. And I'm going, have you read Luke? You'd pass the juice twice. If you thought pattern is what God wanted, you'd be very confused. And then I came upon passages such as this. They're right out in the open. They're not hidden somewhere in Zechariah or in Ezekiel. It's right in the opening of 1 Corinthians. Paul, writing them, says this. I thank God, in chapter 1, verse 14. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you other than Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Wait a minute. This alone destroys the concept of God dictating scripture. Because God wouldn't have dictated to Paul confusion about, did I baptize any more or not? I don't think I did. I only baptized these two. No, wait, there was another household. That doesn't sound like God to me. Sounds like Paul, sounds like a human being. Inspired by God, absolutely. What do we mean by inspired? That comes later. If God breathed every word, how did these things happen? How did these contradictions, and that's what they are, happen? By the way, atheist friends of mine are happy to supply many, many, many examples. Most of the books I have in my library written by atheists are written by former Christians and pastors. At one time, I went through all of them just wondering how in the world? And they all come up with pretty much the same story. Their faith had cracked under examination. And because they could not separate faith in God and Christ from faith from a perfect Bible, it cracked. And when one cracked, everything went away. I was terrified early in my life that I was headed the same direction. Let me step outside the narrative here to reassure you that there is a faith that can withstand any amount of examination. And we're going to lay that out once we first identify and discard some of the false idols we've been carrying around. I had to ask myself if I had been trained to see the Bible for something other than than that which it was. And if that was so, 
what was the Bible? I've used this example before, but as I said recently, I'm only 67, I've only gotten to live one life, so my stories are limited. But if you have an old style 35 millimeter camera, which are coming back, you know it has exchangeable lenses. One of the lenses will be 50 millimeters. They call that normal, because whenever you look through the viewfinder, what you see mirrors, when you pull down the camera, what you see with your eyes. That's normal. I once asked a group of people, why do we call it normal? And they said, because that's the, it shows you the way things really are. And I said, does it? Or does it show you the way things are, we've been told things are? For example, if you put in, let's say, a 28 millimeter, something which is more fisheye, you'll see at the ends that there'll be these little curves. And I'll say, what if that's what the world really is? And as one person said, no, I can put my hand down the door and know that's straight. And I said, no, you've learned the feedback. And your brain has told you that feedback says straight. What if it isn't? And people thought I was being a nut, which I've been a nut. I wasn't being a nut there. This is real neuroscience. To the point where there have been a couple of universities that have done this study. Uh, health and safety doesn't let you do it anymore where incoming freshmen normally really need the extra credit pretty fast during some time during this semester. So you use them for psychology tests often. Uh, and this one was, they had to agree to put on goggles, that the goggles would not be taken off 24-7. Now to me that sounds very miserable, but it gets worse. The goggles turned everything upside down. Still 50 millimeters if you want to talk lenses, but upside down, everything. They had to learn how to go through their day with everything upside down. Now, they weren't allowed to drive, obviously, although stories came out that a couple did. But only after the first week. This was to be a two-week study during a break time. And they got significant credit for it. So they, a lot of them hung with it. Most of them dropped out within the first few days with headaches, dizziness, nausea. Those that kept the glasses on, however, by day five to six were able to walk and maneuver fairly normally. By the end of the study, by 14 days, they, they felt fine other than the discomfort of the goggles. When the goggles were taken off, they had to go through it all again for the next two weeks, readjusting to reality. You see, reality has to do with the lenses through which we look. And your lenses are your training, your culture, the surrounding community, what authority has told you, what you have accepted, the conformity enforced by the group, all of these things, your historical assumptions. The, the problem is everybody thinks the world began the day they were born. No, we have a big pile of stuff that was handed to you at birth. And these assumptions and realities, they're the lenses that shape what we think of as normal. I found great comfort in Paul telling Timothy to rightly divide the word instead of, as I'd always been told, read it, believe it the way we say it, and that settles it. He said, learn how to handle it correctly. Because that's another version of rightly divide, learn how to handle it correctly. Handle with care would be another way to put it. And he told the rest of us that all of these things were for our learning to bring us to Christ. Now that's interesting. In Romans chapter 15, this, in verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to us to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. It didn't talk about law, procedure, doctrine. No, learn from the stories to have encouragement and hope. And he goes further in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Starting at verse 24. So the law was our guardian. Until Christ came. Until Christ came. That we may be justified by faith. Not perfection. Not understanding it all correctly. Not deciding who killed Goliath. And what to do about the David stories. No. 
We're justified by faith. Now, is that faith in all of the Bible? No. This brought us to Jesus. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under the guardian. The guardian brought you here. But now that Jesus has come, you're no longer under the guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there any male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The guardian brought you here, but here is where you're supposed to be now. I am... I graduated school fairly early. I graduated a series of higher institutions of learning. It's not bragging. It's just did it. it. If you sit around long enough, they'll give you something. But I don't go back. I don't go back and sit in Spanish 101 anymore. Didn't do real well the first time. Why would I go back? I don't go to philosophy 401. I don't go back to anatomy and physiology, grad level, whatever. I don't do that. Why? I did that. That brought me to here. Here's where I am now. This is what I do. How pitiful would it be for me to show up every day at my high school and say, can I come in? It'd be freaky. I'd probably be arrested. But how pitiful a life would that be? If we misuse scripture, we never really get to just walk with Jesus. Jesus. Never really get to see who he is and what he can do with us. We instead wrestle with things we don't need to wrestle with. We're going to do a test study on this the next few weeks. And that is we're going to take a look at the role of women in the first century church and in scripture. Notice we just saw a statement from Paul that in Christ, there is no distinction, male nor female. None. We are all one in Christ. Do we, however, put on special glasses when we read scripture that highlight some passages while ignoring others that keep us from seeing others? I think so. Take a look at 1 Timothy, for example. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to take a look at that a lot the next few weeks. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're just going to reach in. Our glasses are only going to let us see verses 11 and 12. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach Or to assume authority over a man, she must be quiet. Well, for many people, that's it. That's all they see. That settles the issue. They look at this. They believe it was written to all believers, in all places, in all times. And yet, they don't generally practice verses 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all the people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. When was the last time you prayed for kings? When was the last time you prayed for the leader of Israel, for the leader of Russia? When was the last time you prayed for the leader of Canada? When was the last time you prayed for these? Generally, we'll say, well, every so often I say, you know, God sort out the government. No, no. If this is for all people at all times and all places, if verses 11 and 12 are, what about here? Um, How about, oh, we could go on. Verse 8, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Without anger or disputing, people I grew up with. Lifting holy hands, do you pray lifting holy hands? Most of you will say, well, I, I believe that that means that we should be living holy lives. You know, I think you're right. But why can you interpret that passage to make it a new normal for you when we don't let people do that with verses 11 and 12? Well, because one's a, well, did you ever notice who's doing what in verses 11 and 12? He says, I do not. He doesn't say almighty God. You ever noticed it? It's shocking to me how many people never notice that whenever I bring it up. But no, we're, we're not done. How about verses 9 and 10, that says women are to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds. Um, you think it's okay for ladies to have jewelry? To do their hair? Think it's okay for ladies to have pretty clothes? I, I do. 
You know why? Because I get the point. He was trying to make a point about where we put our efforts. He wasn't trying to put, I mean, there are churches where women can't cut their hair, can't do anything with it, can't wear any jewelry. Everything has to be plain. Is that, you know why? Because their glasses pull out these verses like our glasses sometimes pull out 11 and 12. Or how about verse 15? We'll talk about that one later. Women will be saved through childbearing. Do you teach that? That a woman doesn't have a child is therefore not saved? Or is there something going on that we don't know about or we have to figure out so we can understand 1 Timothy 2? Spoiler alert, it's that. We'll talk about that. But not today. We're out of time. Our journey up this mountain is not going to be easy one. Tracing these streams is not going to be easy, but it is necessary. Don't stop too soon or you're going to miss out on some of the freedoms and the blessings God intends for all of us who lay aside every weight that so easily entangles us. That sounds familiar. All of that is scripture so that we can give ourselves over to Jesus, the word of God. Because John chapter 4 And I'll close by reading John chapter 4, the first four verses. Listen carefully. The word of God is not a what. It's a who. John 1, 1 through 4. Turn too far. The dramatic moment has passed. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The word of God is not what. The what brings us to the who. Saved by faith in Jesus. The rest we can work out together. Stay with us on the journey. It's going to be fun eventually. God bless you. Go in peace.